<laughs> um, thank you so much, Corky. Um, so yeah, it's nice to be back and thank you for um, new and old friends for, for coming to this talk. So um, my plan is that I'm going to talk for maybe 30 to 40 minutes and then I'm just going to open it up for questions and I, and, and I welcome uh, your, your feedback and your questions about this paper. Um, so let me go to my screen. Right, and thank you for uh, um, thank you, Veronica, for um, for recording it, and also for uh, putting the poster and putting the arrangements together. I really appreciate it. So everybody can see my screen. All right. Okay, great. So let me just get started. Um, um, I think uh, I think I know most of you here, so I'll just do a brief introduction. But basically, I um, right now I just returned to BU last year as a lecturer of social sciences at the College of General Studies, and I look forward to participating more in um, future events in anthropology as well. Since I'm coming back to campus myself, and it's just lovely to be back because BU still feels like home to me. So the paper that I'm talking about today is titled Politics of Indifference, Morning Wang Yue in Late Socialist China. Um, so uh, this picture here, um, I'll just give you a little bit of preview. Um, this depicts a picture of, uh, of a little girl uh, named Wang Yue, whose story is going to form the thread of this, of this presentation that I'm going to talk more about later. A little bit of a backdrop of this paper. This paper actually is going to come out in a few months, I believe, at, at, at the journal How. It belongs to a special section called Political Work of Negative Effects in China, which uh, Lisa recalled at the Free University of Belgium, uh, no, Free University of, of Brussels. Um, nine, author, nine other authors and, and myself have been working on since 2019, in which we collectively explore um, the, the political impact of what we call negative effects in China. So there are two issues that our paper try our papers try to collectively address. So first, we hope to engage in the so-called effective turn in the anthropology in the anthropological study of emotion. Uh, for the last decade or so, effect has become a popular catchphrase, not only in anthropology, but also in cultural and literary studies. Scholars want to develop new ways to capture effects and feelings that lie underneath expressive emotions. And this effective turn actually has created certain discomfort among anthropologists because our craft, um, um, as many of us uh, uh, know, is more about capturing the expressive, capturing the spoken, capturing the performed. So how does this effective turn actually affect our work and how does the case of contemporary China contribute to this, con this conversation? This is the first issue that our, our papers try to collectively address. And secondly, we'd like to examine the political, political implications of negative effects in China, um, uh, where citizens are always encouraged to feel happy, stay positive, and be grateful to the Chinese, uh, Chinese Communist Party. Against this political backdrop, what does it mean to feel bitter, feel afraid, if you're ashamed, if you're troubled, if you're indifferent? What does that mean um, um, for governance, for, um, for, uh, for the political landscape in China? So this is the second question that we are trying to address here. So um, obviously uh, my contribution in this project is that I'm picking one negative effect to examine. And the one that I'm picking is indifferent, which is the translation that I adopt, I, I adopt for the Chinese term lang mo. Okay. So lang mo um, or, or indifference in this, in this paper. It's not a new term in the Chinese language, but what I'm going to show is that lang mo, this term has acquired a new meaning over the last decade or so. I argue that this more recent usage of lang mo actually shows that Chinese citizens themselves are experiencing an effective turn in making sense of the moral landscape in 21st century China. So by turning lang mo from an emotional attached to an individual into a free flowing effect that resides in the society Society, citizens actually invented a new language and genre to interpret social problems in China. As a result, this new understanding about indifference undermined the moral leadership of the socialist state in leading the battle against China's moral crisis. 
So let me just talk a little bit about um, why I say that this um, there is a new usage attached to this term. So traditionally, L'amour is a term that is used to describe individual temperament or, or personality. So for example, L'amour would you would use this word to describe someone who is cool, who is aloof, who doesn't necessarily want to hang out with people, who try to keep distance from other people. So the obvious antonym to L'amour is the word routine, which can be literally translated to be hard, empathetic, passionate. So routine describes someone who is passionate, who is friendly, who is enthusiastic, the opposite of L'amour. So the thing is that someone who is writing, who is hot, passionate, and enthusiastic, they are likely to be more popular and easier to hang out with. Um, but at the same time, there is nothing wrong with being, being a, more aloof, being a more, a more cool, a, a little bit more distant. So both Langmo and writing are just adjectives to describe individual personality and temperament. What I'd like to talk about today is the changing meaning of Langmo since 2011, when Langmo all of a sudden become quite popular in everyday, uh, in everyday usage, following the tragic death of a two-year-old girl named Wang Yue. So I'll tell the story of Wang Yue in more detail later. But here I'd like to point out that the, the way how Langmo is used is quite different from the traditional usage that I was talking about just now. So perhaps more consistent with the literally me literal meaning of these two characters um, that I'm showing here, Lang Mo in 21st century China, it evokes an imagination of a cold desert. The image is cold, it's deadly, it's depressing, it's miserable. So in this latest usage, Lang Mo is not juxtaposed against writing a, a hot and passionate kind of personality. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't exactly mean the lack of passion and enthusiasm. Rather, Langmo became the opposite to compassion. It refers to the general unwillingness to help someone in need. So in other words, Langmo has turned from a relatively neutral description of individual temperament into a shared collective problem that is harmful to the Chinese society. It is not just an emotion that is associated with any single individual, but it becomes an effect that resides in the society at large. So here are the questions that I'm, I'm going to cover um, in this talk. So first, I'd like to start by showing you some evidence to support my analysis that the meaning, the meaning of Langmo has changed. Using ethnographic materials I collected in 2011 and 2012, I will describe the characteristics of this new understanding of indifference. And I'll discuss what, the, uh, um, I'll discuss what these characters characteristics actually can tell us about transforming state society relationship in China. Second, I'd like to discuss the political implication of indifference. When we talk about volunteering activities and social mobilization among young people, we usually talk about how participants would be motivated to act by compassion. But here, I would like to suggest that indifference, which is a, a feeling of dysphoria, the the polar opposite of com compassion can also engender potential for civic action and political change. Right. So before I go into all these like theoretical discussion, I'd like to introduce the incident that forms the backdrop of this current study. It is actually a rather sad story. So on October 13th, 2011, a two year old girl named Wang Yue or some would call her Xiao Yue Yue, Little Yue Yue, as she came to be called. Um, Wang Yue wandered off the street when her parents were busy working in their grocery store. She was knocked down by a minivan and the driver immediately drove away from the scene, leaving two-year-old Wang Yue lying in the middle of the street for seven minutes. In those seven minutes, the girl was run over again by another truck. The sad thing about this double hit and run story is that nobody came to the victim's aid. Tapes from two surveillance cameras shows that 18 pedestrians passed by the dying child, but none of them did anything to help. So most of the 18 people, they paused when they saw the child in blood, but they quickly walked away. After seven long minutes, the girl was finally picked up by a garbage collector and rushed to the hospital, but it was too late. Wang Yue passed away a week later. This, tra this tragedy shocked China. Many were in disbelief that 
18 people passed by a dying child and did nothing to help. And people said that Wang Yue was killed by indifference. And this is the context in which indifference entered popular vocabulary to refer to this general um, phenomenon that nobody was willing to, to lend a helping hand when they see someone in need. So when the tragedy happened, I was doing ethnographic fieldwork about university students and extracurricular organizations in Guangzhou, a city that is not very far from Foshan where this tragedy happened. Um, so many university students whom I worked with at that time, they were eager to talk about the tragedy. They were eager to explore ways for the society to collectively heal. They organized discussion forums and memorial meetings, and they made commemorative materials for the two-year-old victim. So this paper is based on the observation and ethnographic materials that I collected in this gathering. So let me introduce some of the uh, materials that um, um, I'm going to talk about today. The first cluster of materials that I'm going to talk about come from this collection of short films, short videos that university students released two weeks after Wang Yue's death. University students from 10 universities in Guangzhou made these short videos in a campaign that they called Tear Down the Walls Around Your Heart, Say No to Indifference. These student productions, each of which were, was uh, 4 to 14 minutes long, are actually still available for free on Youku, which is the YouTube of China. So there are three observations that I'd like to highlight about these films. First, these films portray that indifference exists beyond the individual. Indifference is compared to a contagious disease and a toxin that makes the world turn gray. It exists in the air and corrupts the social environment. So for example, one phrase that was frequently used in conjunction with indifference was uh, xin qiang a wall around one's heart. So this wall numbs the heart and prevents it from empathizing with other people's suffering. It blockades kindness, it blockades compassion from circulating in the society, and it cannot be demolished overnight. However, this, wall man this, this metaphor of a wall, wall around the heart, it also asserts that the heart is actually healthy. The heart has the innate ability to feel. And Empathy and compassion can be restored once the heart manages to break free of the walls. The ultimate solution to societal indifference, therefore, is not to fix the heart or to fix any single individual. Uh, something has to be done to remove the blockade that basically just free the heart. The heart is not broken. All it needs is an enabling environment to, to thrive. So the second point that I want to draw attention to is that the film conveys a very clear message that indifference kills. Everyone and anyone can be its potential victim. So it's actually quite an uh, uncanny coincidence that four out of these 10 films depict scenes of suicide or attempted suicide. So in a suicide, there were really no obvious culprit or, or villain. No one was, no one made this fictional characters jump off the building. Um, all these people, students who otherwise had, had a healthy life, had a, had a bright future, they were driven to kill themselves, not by any single event that was particularly traumatizing. But small setbacks in everyday life adds up. And these otherwise healthy individuals, they became suicidal because they felt that nobody cares about them. Indifference is murderous and no one knows who its next victim would be. So I also want to point out that all of these victims or survivors depicted in these films, they are university students. You can argue that it's sort of like a choice of convenience because they can recruit the students to basically just act in the film. Um, but it also suggests that student, student filmmakers are inviting their, their audience to identify themselves with the victim here. So in a way, these films encourage viewers to imagine themselves as victims of indifference rather than the, the hero who would do something to help. And the third point I want to make is about um, ways to tackle indifference. So in all of these 10 films, students do suggest what should be done to the situation. Uh, for example, if you walked by someone who tripped and fell, you should definitely offer help. Um, you should always be, be ready to offer bicycle rides to a classmate in need. Look at how sad this girl is. And I guess it doesn't hurt, doesn't, doesn't hurt that like she's somewhat good looking. 
You should also try to get up earlier than your classmates to do on a Saturday morning, like this girl on the on the far far right is doing. Um, basically, to to stand by stand by the road and help to direct traffic on a relatively empty campus. So here, consistent with what the Chinese state likes to encourage its citizens to do, students should always be prepared to help people around them to perform good deeds when the situation calls for, no matter how small these good deeds might be. Students should also spend their free time or sacrifice their time that they could have otherwise spent sleeping to volunteer for a good cause. Of course, it is questionable what this student volunteer wanted to accomplish by standing there with minimal traffic on a Saturday morning, but it is the proactive action and the self-sacrificial um, kind of spirit that count here. So I'd like to point out that in at least three films, the most helpful individual also had the worst luck. So in one film, for example, the newly minted captain of the university basketball team uh, unfortunately got hit by a car when he was going out at night to purchase cough medicine for a roommate who was sick. Um, so after the accident, his right leg is permanently injured and he cannot be the captain of the basketball team anymore. In another film, which is actually depicted in the, in the center, center um, picture, this picture in the center here. Um, this person who is offering a ride eventually became the boyfriend of this rather good looking girl. Um, it's a good way to connect to people if you offer them bicycle rides. It is later revealed that these, this character, he actually had a terminal illness. So the, the film was really about how he tried to spread his best to show, show the girlfriend that like the world is full of love, the world is full of kindness before he, he finally died at the end of the film. Um, as for the, for the really helpful individual who volunteered to, to direct traffic on campus, um, later on in the film, she, she accidentally dropped her suitcase and all her belongings were flying everywhere. People who walked by just ignored her and did nothing to help. Okay. So, the, I mean, like this, this cluster of film is showing that like there are actual things that students can be doing to counter indifference. But at the same time, it's really weird that like all these individuals do not, they, they, they are not really rewarded for the good deeds that they are, they are doing. Interestingly, the filmmakers also made other suggestions. For example, one film encourages people to say hi to, to random strangers in the city because it's going to make the society happier, warmer, friendlier. This other music video that I'm showing on the right, it uh, encourages, encourages the viewers to open their heart to feelings in its refrains. These suggestions to counter indifference differ from what I was showing in the previous slides in that they are not necessarily about volunteering action that they deliver some sort of uh, utility. They are about cultivating feelings and civic connections. So let me give another example about this. So um, this is actually my favorite video among the, the 10. In this rather thoughtful time-lapse video, Students use pieces of cardboard papers to construct a crying face of Wang Yue uh, on a school courtyard, surrounded by, by different words. There are words, for example, um, some are even in English, selfish, cold. Um, and there are also Chinese words um, of leng more, indifference, bystanding, impassivity, all kinds of bad things that are surrounding this crying face of Wang Yue. As the time-lapse video progressed, we see that participants removed the words in the backdrop these words that symbolize all kinds of negative effects in the, in the social, social environment. Then, the, um, then they remove the cardboard pieces um, around the eyes to remove the tears of Wang Yue and eventually um, rearrange the pieces to give her a smile. So the message here is very clear. You need to remove the negative effect that, that exists in the society before this girl can smile again. So the film concluded with the call for viewers to work together, to tear down the wall around their hearts, to let sunshine come in, to, to work for this, this, this dawn, to work to see light that is, that is lying just in the horizon. It's a call for collective action, not to, not to necessarily volunteer or do good deeds, but to basically create a more enabling and pleasant environment for everybody. So here, the cure for indifference is to remove the negative effects and fill the space with smile and sunshine. So what I want to emphasize here is that students call, um, um, what I want to emphasize is that it's my argument that 
um, uh, in the context of socialist governance in China, where responsible citizenship was defined by performing quantifiable good deeds following the moral leadership of the socialist state, cultivating feelings and effective connections are not usually the focus in, in state propaganda about volunteerism and citizen mobilization. So let me elaborate what I mean. What I saw in these films are students rewriting of the socialist script in telling the story of China's moral crisis. The tragedy of Wang Yue and the language of indifference allowed students to replace the image of Lei Feng on the left, who is the socialist hero championed by the state, with the image of Wang Yue on the right, which is a gentle face of an innocent child in leading China out of its moral crisis. So Lei Feng, for those of you who are not familiar with his legacy, was a young soldier in the People's Liberation Army in the 1960s. Because of his love for Chairman Mao and the Chinese Communist Party, Lei Feng always helped the sick and the weak. He always shared what he had with the poor. He always volunteered to serve his communities. He always did more than other people did in the grand enterprise of building Chinese communism. He even worked himself to death at the young age of 22. So Lei Feng uh, in, in communist propaganda, he exemplified the collective responsibility and self-sacrificing spirit uh, in, the, in the communist playbook. Lei Feng's image was still all over the city subway stations and university campuses when I was in China in 2011 and 2012. Um, that was 50 years after he died. So um, uh, for the purpose of this, uh, of this paper, um, Lei Feng is relevant for our understanding of the official narrative about Wang Yue's death and, um, and why it's talked about in the way it did. So the official narrative basically explains that the situation of 18 people turning a blind eye on a dying child, um, um, they explain the situation by putting the blame on the indifferent individuals. 18 people pass by, they are indifferent, they are not Lei Feng, they did nothing to help. If they, if one of these 18 people, they had listened to the party, they behaved more like Lei Feng, they would not have ignored the child. So moral breakdown happened here when citizens deviated from their rightful responsibility to, be, uh, to become a proper socialist citizens. So the solution proposed by party propaganda is that in order to tackle indifference, we have to double down on state-led civic, uh, civic and moral education. The Chinese society needed more Lei Feng who would act selfless, selflessly for the greater good under the moral leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. If we could re basically repopulate urban China with Lei Feng, with good deeds, then the society would go back to normal. There is nothing fundamentally wrong about the Chinese society right now. So Wang Yue's image represented something rather different. In students' portrayal, China is not just in a temporary state of moral breakdown. It, it's in a state of perpetual dysfor uh, dysphoria. The moral crisis that killed Wang Yue was basically is just going to, to keep coming back if we do not address the root cause of it, which is an indifferent society, not the indifferent individual. Um, something needs to be done to change the existing social order. Everybody was a victim of indifference and state propaganda promoted Lei Feng as the solution to this crisis situation, but this simply wouldn't work. Ultimately, China would need a warmer social environment that makes it possible for individuals to be moral again. In order for that to happen, people need to cultivate feelings and forge connections with fellow citizens. So moving beyond the student films, this general motif about this disempowered moral, uh, moral agents, people cannot, did not really have like the, the freedom or the autonomy to act. It was actually very obvious in the way how students talk about Wang Yue's death also in other contexts. So this slide displays some of the quotes that I collected in discussion meeting about the tragedy. Um, students generally agree that the 18 pedestrian would not have walked away as if nothing had happened. Um, uh, they should not do that. They should, they should have done something. But at the same time, when they keep talking about the incident, they realize that there was really not much that these 18, um, 18 pedestrians could have done. They were able to put themselves in the shoe of these 18 pedestrians to actually rethink how would they themselves react to the situation. And the answer is that, that that's not, nothing much that they can do. They keep 
coming back to this 2007 court case involving a person called Peng Yue. Peng Yue, Peng Yue is a young person. He is, a, he is a good Samaritan. He tries to help um, an old lady who basically uh, who tripped when she was trying to get off a bus. Um, later on, um, so, so he, he helped out of his, the goodness of his heart. But the problem is that like afterwards, he actually got sued by this old lady because the old lady said that like Peng Yu was the one who actually caused the injury in the first place. And the surprising thing is that, that the old lady actually won. So Peng Yu was made to pay money to this old lady um, whom he helped. So this incident was still vivid in people's imagination about the danger of being good Samaritans. Basically, the, the lesson that they're getting is that like in contemporary China nowadays, you cannot just, just rent, help a random stranger in need because that might be someone who would, uh, who would take advantage of you, who would scam you, you would get into trouble. So in this context, students really feel that like if they walked by Wang Yue, what could they what could they do? I mean, this is a real question that really trouble all these, all these students or all these young people who really try to do something good in this society. Um, so let me show you a few, um, few quotes that, that I see uh, keeps, keeps coming back in some of this discussion about, about Wang Yu, uh, about, about the tragedy. So students believe that indifference is the result of circumstances. They don't want to be indifferent, but the society make them indifferent. Um, it's all the fault of the society. Um, it's not that individuals are not willing to help, but the fact is that they are unable to help. And for those of you who are China specialists here, you might recognize this quote, um, uh, it actually comes from a reworking of, uh, of Mencius' um, model about like how Mencius, um, the Confucian master, he believes that everybody uh, innately capable to help people. Uh, whether they actually help people, it actually, I mean, it's, it's, it's a question whether they're willing to help. It's not about a question of whether they are able to help. And here the students sort of like flip this uh, quote around and say that nowadays in urban China, Mencius, Confucian kind of principles, they don't work anymore because individuals, we just cannot help. It's not that we are not willing to, but we are not able to. Society is at fault here. Um, and here are some other materials that I got from participating in a memorial event organized by Wang Yue seven days after she died. There, um, these are all messages that students left for Wang Yue on the poster board. I'm surprised about the frequent motif of heaven in this uh, in these messages because they don't talk about just Tian, they talk about Tian Tang. They don't talk about the Chinese underworld. They talk about the Western heaven in sort of like in the, in the Christian sense of the term. So what it means is that students express their wishes that um, Wang Yue would thereby enter heaven in the Christian world um, because of the choice of vocabulary that they are using here. Um, because in heaven, in the, in the West, there would be no indifference. Their hope was that the girl would not become a wandering ghost, a victim of premature death uh, usually would, um, because that, that would be sad. They didn't want Wang Yue to enter an underworld that was more conventionally associated with Chinese cosmology. They used the word heaven, they used Aman to basically express the, express the wish that Wang Yue would be able to escape China. Um, otherwise, I mean, indifference would, would be there forever if her soul lingered in China in her life, afterlife. Salvation can only be sought elsewhere. So my point here is that even though students had no intention to cr criticize the Communist Party and the state, the activities and the language that they use, um, in fact, destabilized the moral, the moral leadership of the socialist state. It is clear that citizens did not trust the state in leading them out of the moral crisis. And having a new language of indifference to talk about the situation creates a new civic platform to share and acknowledge these feelings of skepticism and collective dis disempowerment. So um, let me reiterate my message here. 
In China, where the political state had tried to reclaim credit for all altruistic behavior, anxiety about indifference allowed citizens to sidestep socialist ethics in conversations about civic mobilization. University students use the language of feeling and mourning to reinvent the protagonist, culprit, and victim in Wang Yue's tragedy, thereby developing new rationales for committing good deeds without also acknowledging the moral leadership of the socialist state. This shifting focus allows students and engaged citizens to reimagine doing good deeds not as a political responsibility of a good citizen, but as a humanistic desire for sharing feelings and forging effective connections with fellow citizens. So as opposed to the standard association of indifference, when we think about indifference, we think about like detached individuals, we think about like the breaking of social connections. What I'm trying to suggest here is that indifference, maybe they have the civil potential to connect. Um, in, the, in the China field right now, when we talk about, again, when we talk about volunteerism, when we talk about people mobilizing, we tend to use the language of compassion, that um, um, you're compassionate, that's why you help. Um, but what I am starting to see from a material is that maybe we should we should pay more attention also to indifference um, or, or disappointment as some other authors in some other anthropologists working in other post-socialist contexts also observed that indifference or skepticism or disappointment or cynicism cynicism all of these things they are negative effect but at the same time if we look at them clearly uh, more carefully maybe we can also see civic potential that maybe it becomes a new platform for uh, for citizens to connect and really to to devise new solution uh, for social problems especially when um, giving them a new vo vocabulary to imagine to uh, to articulate what they are doing that they are, they are doing things, they are helping, they are, they are trying to feel, they are learning to be a better citizen, not because they are inspired by the socialist state like Lei Feng was, but there was something something on that, that something else that is going on that, um, um, that people, people may not necessarily have the language or vocabulary to pinpoint yet. So um, I think I'm just going to stop here so that um, um, I can take some questions. Thank you for coming to this talk and I welcome your comments and questions. Uh, thank you.